Hello and welcome to this review of my Cherry UB88-0005, or VB88, it's hard to tell, but all the reference of this family of keyboards I could find online was for UB. Anyway, I got this off of eBay almost half a year ago, and it wasn't too expensive, $50. This keyboard is something I wanted to cover for a long time anyway, so it's worth the money I reckon. This is partly because it's rather old. The only date indication I could find is this Tested 83 sticker, which means it's at least as old as 1983. I found these green Tested stickers on keyboards before, and sometimes those are dated way after the actual manufactured day, so it could well be even older, but I reckon 1983 sounds pretty reasonable. It's a very small keyboard, about 29 by 13 and a half centimeters, and it appears to have been used either for space-saving purposes or with some kind of small terminal or specialty machine. I guess it falls in the category of navless keyboards, the ones where the nav cluster that's usually in the middle, the one with the arrow keys and stuff, is missing, but where there's still a numpad. Think of it like a TKL, except different. To put things into perspective, here's what it looks like compared to an IGK-61. It's almost exactly the same width, but because of this massive bottom bezel here, it's a lot deeper. Still, for the 80s especially, this would have been pretty tiny. By the way, there are still arrow keys, but they're part of the numpad. And speaking of which, this has got to be, without a shimmer of doubt, the weirdest arrow layout I've ever seen. I mean, the down arrow is on top, and the up arrow is on the bottom, and right isn't on the right, but in the middle. It's like an inverted T-nav, but tilted 90 degrees and then mirrored down the horizontal. I mean, I think if they put the keys on in a random order, it wouldn't have been as fucked up as this. In order to make it even smaller, they went with extra small keycaps as well. The units are 0.6 Imperial Derp Nerps long, which is 80% the size of a normal keycap, which is 0.75 Derp Nerps. Even though a 20% reduction in size might not sound like a lot, they look and feel really tiny and petite. Such cuties, I mean, compared to the later keycaps, the difference is huge. They're also very flat, in fact, the keycap profile is flat uniprofile. At only about 6.5mm tall, it's practically the early 80s equivalent of a chiclet keyboard. They're still ABS double shots though, and quite thick. In fact, at fully 2mm, they're a third thicker than even their own MX type keycaps, and combined with the enormous stem, it's almost solid plastic. They're two-way incompatible with Cherry MX keycaps, by the way. And just look at how enormous that font size is. Holy crap! I've also seen closely related versions of this board where the keycaps are more obviously spherical, as well as black. These grey ones are also spherical, but the sides are much steeper, so they don't look at as much. The height of the keyboard was clearly a major focus point because it comes with Cherry M8, which is an early extra low profile switch. It's the rare version with the closed top. These are most often found with the top open, like this, because this allows the switch to be slightly shorter in height. The design is exceedingly simple. It's a stationary contact and a flexible one, which is separated by a cam protruding from the slider. As you push the switch, the cam moves out of the way and the contacts are allowed to meet, closing the circuit, exactly like Cherry MX, except that the contact motion is orthogonal to it. The slider is somehow clipped into the housing and it appears to be excessively fragile. On another M8 board, I broke two sliders in half just by trying to remove them, so I stopped. Note also that this design is DP compatible. Ho ho ho. Now what I mean is that they could put a second pair of contacts here to make it a double pole single throw switch, hence why the slider has a cam on the other side as well. There are also single pole only versions of this switch. The switch design predates that of the more well-known MX switch, which are Model 10 after all, hence the X. Well, there's also an actual Cherry M10 switch, but that one hasn't even been discovered in the wild yet, so it's rather obscure, perhaps abandoned. There's also M7, which was their full-height standard gold crosspoint switch type, with subtypes M6, 5 and 4, and M9, which was an intermediate height. Even an M11, which was a rather failed design that reportedly just falls apart. Anyway, Cherry MX was designed as a low-profile substitute for Cherry M7, which was too tall for the ergonomic standards of the early 80s. However, M8 remained in production as an extra low-profile alternative until it was discontinued, which was as late as 2013. 
The key feels pretty crap. It's neither particularly smooth nor interesting, but it is much too short and stiff. At just 2.5 millimeters, and what appears to be 70 grams of force, if I understood this cherry catalog from 1982 correctly. 70 grams of force is even stiffer than Cherry MX Black, which is 60, and although I don't know the bottom out force of these M8 switches, I suspect it's significant as well. It just kind of lacks punch, you know, it's not exactly whoop, 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 whoop. Together with the tiny keycaps, which barely have any dividing space between the key tops, it's very easy to accidentally hit multiple keys at once, which is one of the reasons I don't like small or particularly steep sided keycaps. The spacebar is especially terrible and stiff to the point of ridicule. Not only is the switch extremely heavy at 95 grams operating force, which is already enough to make one wince, but the stabilizers or something else in here makes it even worse. It's possibly the most unyielding spacebar I've ever seen and yet also one of the least well stabilized ones. As you can see, the other side doesn't go down properly at all and typing on it feels absolutely abysmal. Apparently the lifetime of these switches isn't super high either at 10 million cycles. Of course this, and the rather shite key feel, can't be fully blamed on it, as super low switches like this just give the manufacturer literally a lot less room to work with. The slightly taller intermediate height M9 series had a rather specific 16 million operation specified, while the full height M7 was spec at 20 million, a rather standard figure for contact based switches in those days. One thing that's remarkably uncherry about the UB88 is the build quality. Normally cherry products like their long-time standard keyboard, the G83000, are basically keyboard soup with just a bare PCB and some switches floating in a plastic case. But this thing has a metal mounting plate and even a full metal case, top and bottom. It's 1.6 millimeters thick, or about 1 16th of a derp nerp, and quite sturdy, but I don't think it's steel because the keyboard, rather small size notwithstanding, weighs only 670 grams, which is not that much even for a 60% keyboard. So I suspect it's aluminium, which is not as good as steel, of course, but hey, I'll take it. Massive cable as well, at more than 6mm thick, and a metal plug head. The cable barely even bends, which may actually work out as a disadvantage if you can't move that out of place. Unfortunately, I can't use it because it uses a 6-pin 240-degree DIN connector and I still have no idea how to convert stuff like this, but maybe that's for the best, as these switches really don't feel nice and the cramped keys make you type either very slowly, very badly, or both. But still, it's a really cool little keyboard and a great addition to my collection. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me attempting to type on this keyboard.